Yeah. Again, first of all, let, let's let some uh, inject some humility. It's very hard to find something that no one else has thought of. Right. I mean, the the growth businesses that we own are you would pretty much and all of your listeners would know. Uh, you know, you can the diamonds in the rough are extremely rare, and then even rarer is to find them underpriced. So. You know, you're never going to find a 20% grower at eight times earnings. If, 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 you know, if you do, you're, you're wrong in one of those and it's probably the former. Uh, so, okay. What do you, but you know, we like growth. So what, how do we find it? Some of those, and then, and we also, again, all of our forecasts include a fade. So trees don't grow to the sky. None of our growth companies we think will grow forever because not only do we as investors recognize it, so does all the comp competition. And they're jumping in there and applying capital and trying to take away and capture some of that growth. So for us, the key to a sustainable growth company is understanding the competitive advantage. And I, I think we can, we'll talk more about that. But the other thing is, and I, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a cliche, but markets often overestimate news in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. So. You know, a lot of those growth areas that you know about can continue to grow faster than a lot of people think for much longer. What you want to do is find a business that can be in that segment or, or industry and not lose that growth to somebody else. Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long term investor. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I sit down with Rick Schmidt, Portfolio Manager at Harding Lohner. We talk to Rick about quality growth investing and how his firm uncovers quality stocks for the long run. The use of Michael Porter's Five Forces model and framework along with a disciplined, transparent, and rigorous investment process, sit at the core of how they find and analyze investments for the firm's portfolios. This is a great discussion around one firm's unique investment process. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Harding Lovener's Rick Schmidt. Rick, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. We're going to talk about quality investing, how you think about high quality growth stocks, global investing, and the factors that you and your firm look at, um, and we'll try to get some market insights uh, from you as well. But before we get into that, I wanted to ask you about your early experience as a professional investor, because I was looking at your background and I noticed that you spent um, a good part of your early investing career in both Hong Kong and in Europe. And so um, we actually haven't had a lot of investors on the podcast that have that international experience. So I want to start by maybe just asking you if you could kind of share um, how those experiences in those other countries maybe impacted you as an investor in the way you look at things. Uh, you know, I should caveat that some of the things, my experiences, they, they, they probably could have happened to me in the U.S. as well. But uh, I, of course, view my own narrative and see them as being very important to be being international. And I, I think there's a couple things that definitely stand out. Part of it is when you go well, and at the timing, I, I moved to Hong Kong in 1986. And at that time, markets were just opening up in, in Asia. Uh, there actually was not a Chinese stock market. India was not, uh, invested by foreigners. South Korea was not invested by foreigners. Taiwan was not invested by foreigners. You had Singapore, Malaysia and Hong Kong had just combined four, five stock exchanges. I forget into one. So. You not only had these things happening and then they just basically, uh, one by one, the dominoes, you know, Thailand opened up and then uh, Indonesia opened up and et cetera, et cetera. But two things happened. The first is I got a lot of experience at an embarrassingly young age because not only were the markets small, there weren't a lot of investors out there. So as one of the few people out there, you got a lot of uh, exposure to markets and to, to things that were going on. Second, you saw so many cycles. So. You know, if you started in 86 in the U S you would have definitely seen the 87 crash. Uh, you would have seen the, uh, tech bubble. And then, you know, we all would have seen the GFC, but you know, we had Tiananmen square in 89, there was tequila crisis in Mexico. There was the Russian bond crisis. There was the Asian crisis. And, you know, I, I think that has played a huge role 
uh, in shaping what I am as an investor today, not only seeing, you know, if we want to use the word bubble, we can, but big booms and then big busts and then what happened with time. And, and the final one, I'll twist it a bit is you also find a lot of commonality. So, you know, like anything, you can look at it and find the differences, or you can say, Hey, you know, it doesn't matter what language the annual report is written in, you know, the cash flows are going to be discounted and give you the value of that stock over time. So there are things not only among people, I mean, there's a lot of commonalities in people that, uh, you know, normal cultural stereotypes kind of distinguish the differences on, but there's a lot of things that are very, very similar, both from my time in Asia, my time in, I was in London, so in the UK. Uh, and then back in the U.S. It's it's just interesting that those markets are, a lot of those markets are still, you know, relatively young. They weren't necessarily as established, you know, like the U.S. market was. So it's just, that's an interesting thing to think about that, you know, in the last 30 or 40 years, a lot of these international markets really were, you know, de basically developing where the U.S. market has decades of history behind it. Absolutely. And data, right? I mean, even if you look back and try to find some of that data, it doesn't, even if, even if you can find it, it doesn't, a lot of it doesn't make sense because the markets were so small, the stocks that were listed in the beginning were, are no longer um, significant parts of the market. Um, one of the uh, things we wanted to kind of talk to you about was the, this idea of quality investing. So as a quality growth manager, you know, just generally speaking, how do you go about defining what a quality company actually is? So. I don't want to get into false precision and I, and I'll give a caveat that, uh, the, the founders of our company always give. So when, when Dan Harding and David Lovner and Simon Hallett, who, uh, joined as CIO very soon after, uh, when they decided the criteria that Harding Lover was going to invest in, which is now called quality growth, that was not a factor. You know, there were the, the, these things came later. They just decided what companies that they thought you would make money in over time. And basically they were businesses that were growing. And then the quality aspect that you talk about, well, they wanted that growth to be able to be compounded, uh, over longer periods of time, you know, longer growth is worth more than, than a shorter period of growth. And you want your companies to be able to withstand macro, which you don't think you can predict. So, you know, we want a strong balance sheet. We want managements that will be forward looking at least, you know, whose incentives aren't so flawed that they'll take some of those returns. So. The aspects of quality that they developed actually over time, we've quantified more and more and, and, you know, we have basically four things we look for growth, good management, uh, good balance sheets and a competitive advantage. Now, you know, who doesn't want that? Those are pretty similar, no matter what label you put on your, your company underneath that, you know, we do have a number of criteria that we use and we try to get as quantitative as we can with it. And very specifically, you asked about quality. We have about 10 factors that we look at. Most of them are based on profitability, stability of profitability, and the, the balance sheet, you know, fiscal strength. One of the things, uh, we, we've always struggled with is quants is, you know, at, for growth investing, you know, discretionary investors like you tend to have a better time of it than we do. And, and one of the reasons is because if you look at the growth space in general, you know, expectations for companies tend to get a little ahead of themselves. And so your average growth stock doesn't do that well, but by the same token, like the absolute best performers in the market all tend to come from that growth category. So you've got this category that doesn't do that great, but you've got the absolute best companies. So the ability to identify those diamonds in the rough becomes really important. And I'm wondering if you could just give us an idea of some of the things you think about when you're looking at a growth company and trying to evaluate whether it can continue that growth going forward. Yeah. Again, first of all, let's, let's, um, uh, inject some humility. It's very hard to find something that no one else has thought of, right? I mean, the, the growth businesses that we own are, you would pretty much, and all of your listeners would know, uh, you know, you can, the diamonds in the rough are extremely rare and then even rare is to find them underpriced. So, you know, you're never going to find a 20% grower at eight times earnings. If, if, if you know, if you do, you're, you're wrong in one of those and it's probably the former, uh, so, okay, what do you, but you know, we like growth. So what, how do we find it? Some of those, and then, and we also, again, all of our forecasts include a fade. So trees don't grow to the sky. None of our growth companies we think will grow forever because not only do we as investors recognize it, so does all the comp competition and they're jumping in there and applying capital and trying to take away and capture some of that growth. So 
for us, the key to a sustainable growth company is understanding the competitive advantage. And I, I think we can, we'll talk more about that. But the other thing is, and I, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a cliche, but markets often overestimate news in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. So, you know, a lot of those growth areas that you know about can continue to grow faster than a lot of people think for much longer. What you want to do is find a business that can be in that segment or, or industry and not lose that growth to somebody else. One of the things I noticed in listening to another interview with you is, is that you guys use Michael Porter's five forces in your investing process. And for listeners who aren't aware of them, I'm wondering if you could just talk about what those are and how they play a role in your process. So uh, Michael Porter's five forces were written, uh, they're how many years? Uh, 50 years old. Uh, he, he wrote the, the book originally, originally it was a Harvard Business School article, I think, and then uh, uh, a book in 1980 called competitive strategy. And, and the, the five forces are the threat of new entrants, uh, the risk of substitution, power of suppliers, power of buyers, and rivalry are the, the level of that, that competition. For us, Harding Lugner, okay, there's no secret, right? Every uh, MBA has uh, seen or, or heard of or studied uh, the five forces. So what do you do with it? First of all, when we bring a company up for uh, review or, you know, whether it can be included in our, in our investment universe, we have some templates and we have a lot of work to we do into describing that information. And, and we want to make sure we understand each of those forces and their impact on the company. And of course we want a company who's stronger than the market in all of those ideally, but it's also a, it's a, so in addition to being a lens, so it's a lens in which you look at businesses and then it's a language. So it allows us to use, to discuss with our analysts, so we have portfolio managers, we have analysts, so all of our portfolio manage, managers, including myself, are also analysts uh, because we like to keep uh, people uh, uh, even playing field or at least to uh, not create that dichotomy in a, within an organization. But the result of that is, you know, how do you discuss a business where the, you see changes going on? If you can talk about it through the five forces, Yes, of course, you can push and shove them and make something fit that maybe doesn't fit. But the reality is it allows you to talk on a, on a similar level. So uh, if I can digress, you know, TSMC is a, is a business I think you probably know about. Taiwan Semiconductor, a lot of people understand a fantastic business, you know, no substitutions, almost no rivals. You know, they dominate their industry. Now there's a threat, a geopolitical threat. You would normally think, oh, that, you know, was China going to, uh, invade is the U S going to ban, can make you bring everything back, uh, and, and make it in the U S if we think about that through Michael Porter, that's not something you would normally think about. What's a competitive strategy. That seems like a totally outside event. Well, no, actually we can have a discussion about the power of the buyers. If, if the U S demands that computer chips must be made in the United States, well, TSMC's clients are going to either shift to Intel in the U S or TSMC is going to have to build a plant in the U.S. So that buyer power just rose. Whereas now, you know, you got to go to TSMC. So, all right, let's talk about that. How strong can that buyer power get? How difficult is it for Intel to copy what TSMC is doing? How difficult it is for TSMC to do what they're doing in the U.S.? Now, there's a basis for a discussion. One of the things we, we've heard a lot recently is this whole idea of, you know, inflation is obviously on the rise and that it may be with us for a long time. And I'm wondering as a growth investor, how you think about inflation, you know, you could argue that maybe you want to focus on more on firms with pricing power during a period like this, but you could also argue maybe, you know, you continue your process the way it is. And, you know, you sort of, these macro factors are tough to predict. So I'm just wondering how you think about the idea of potential inflation in the future as someone who's managing your growth portfolio. You go right back to quarter and you just look at that buyer power, right? So, you know, if, if you, uh, are setting the price of a product and, and there's only you. You know, you pass that inflation, you pass that inflationary cost pressure straight on through. Now, if there's, you know, alternatives and some, some, for some reason have lower costs than you, well, okay. Now you have a difficulty. When, when you look at a business, you want to find someone who their buyers and, you know, from a quantitative point are, are very fragmented, uh, and you have a dominant market position and you can also, if you want, you can look at, uh, those, those levels of concentrations are HHIs, right? Uh, uh, indexes are, are available. You can also look at the uh, historical performance. You know, what, what, it's been a while since we had inflation, but a lot of the businesses do go back. Were they able to pat what happened to their margins last time there were high inflation. But I think the important thing, got to remember that, you know, 
every price today should be optimal, right? There's no company leaving money on the table, There's no well-run company. So it's a trade-off as it is today. You know, do you pass on, do you take a price and give up market share or do you, you know, maintain your market share and, and, and take it in price? With inflation, it's exactly the same issue. You know, do you pass on that price? It's the same issue you are looking at today. So I don't think it changes that much if you put it in that context. As you can probably tell, we're, we're asking you a lot of things that, you know, are concepts that as quants, we have trouble quantifying. And, you know, speaking to you as a discretionary investor, you know, sort of helping us to understand them. And, and a brand is another one of those because we've had a lot, of, you know, quantifying a brand is incredibly difficult. And so that's another area where discretionary, discretionary investors probably have a big advantage over us. And I'm wondering if there are just some major things you look for when you're, when you're trying to identify a company that has a strong brand. In a way, I, I hesitate a bit because there's no magic formula. And I think you, you, you've, you're noting it. If, you, if there was, you would have, you'd be using it. At the very basic, you invert the question, you know, what doesn't have a brand? And, uh, you know, a, well, that's a commodity. It doesn't matter that the, the quality is the same. If you reach a certain level of quality, the price is the same. And you can, Buffett's great quote, right? Nobody goes to the supermarket and asks for Howie's corn. So his son, Howard, is a farmer, grows corn. You don't buy a branded corn. So there's your first example. What, what isn't a brand? It's a product that differentiation after you reach a certain quality doesn't exist. Then what does it mean? Okay, then we have brands. There's got to be a superiority or a signal of superiority for a brand to exist. Uh, you know, people either have to associate it, uh, they know they're going to get a quality, they're willing to pay a higher price, uh, or it signals to other people that they paid a high price. So we can go get in all the psychology of, of brands. But the, for, I mean, the, 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 if you want to look at it quantitatively, I think one of the ways you can look at it is take a look at the price premium a product can get uh, over uh, a generic or, or the market average. That will indicate to you the, the significance of a brand. In addition, you look at price elasticity. So how much is demand impacted when you, in, when you raise the price? And in a perfect world, I don't, I don't know if they exist, or not, in, not perfect. In a theoretical world, there's a Veblen good, right? The higher the price goes, the more people want. Uh, now, maybe you can say some luxury goods is, Maybe an NFT or something has that, but the reality is that very few do that. When you push up the price, you lose some demand. What you want to have is a product who has the least elasticity and you can discover some of that through historical action. You can discover some of that through, you know, more qualitative analysis. When we had uh, Michael Mobus on the podcast, one of the things we talked about a lot is this idea of tangible and intangible assets. And he talked about how, you know, 20 years ago, the vast majority of the assets that existed were tangible. And now the majority of them are intangible. And I'm wondering as a growth investor, how do you think about that? If you had to alter your process at all to account for the fact that we have a lot more intangible assets out there now? So first of all, I, uh, I like Michael Mollison's uh, work a lot and we use it a lot, uh, uh, in our own, it's, it's been very influential in, in some of the things that we've put together. Specifically, it hasn't had a big impact on, on how we value companies because we're basically in the end, uh, discount, looking at discounted cash flows and it, it doesn't matter to us whether you're spending $100 million on a new plant or $100 million on, a, on an ad campaign. Uh, that $100 million is going out the door. What matters is the return you get on that, and that's what we can look at in the investment. So, yeah, I, I, I would say we pay a lot less attention to price-to-book ratios, but we never based our uh, analysis on price-to-book because of that change you mentioned. That makes sense. You know, when you're using a cash flow based analysis, you know, those types of things are going to mean less than they would if you were using a different approach. Um, you alluded early in the interview to the concept of valuation. You know, you, see, you tend to get people on both sides in growth investing. You get tend, tend to get people who say, all right, I'm going to buy the absolute best companies and I'm not going to really pay too much attention to valuation. And then you, on the other end, you get people who do pay some attention to what they're paying for, you know, a dollar of growth. And I'm wondering how you look at that, where you fall in terms of how important valuation is in your process. So it's very important. I, we fall much, much more in the second camp if there is. I'm a little, you know, uh, you gotta be a bit careful because, uh, I think also as Michael Mobison would say, you know, you know, we, what we really want, everyone wants to pay less than value. You know, we, you're talking about price and even Buffett and Munger talk about, you know, value growth being just part of the value, uh, equation, you know, an asset that is going to give you more cash because it's growing faster. is going to be worth more than an asset, which is growing slower or not growing at all. What we do is, uh. It's a third leg. So if, if, if we demand quality and we demand growth, uh, we want in that area to get 
what we think is the best value, meaning that what we think were uh, prices will over time uh, go up. And it has been a challenge. I mean, you're absolutely right. Without a doubt, the uh, prices of quality growth companies have gotten more expensive over time. Now, we can argue whether that's justifiable or not. Within that, you know, again, you don't have to listen to my words, look at the actions of the Harding Lovner portfolios. We have been shifting out of what we think are some of the most expensive growth companies into ones where we find more reasonable valuations. And there, there has seemed to be sort of a dichotomy in the growth space. You know, you've had the companies that the FANG stocks actually aren't, haven't seemed to be that expensive, at least relative to history. But then you've got this other group, you know, trading at 30 times sales and maybe not so much these days because those have come down. But, you know, there, there do seem to be an opportunity to find high quality growth companies, but also, you know, a, a group of companies that are trading at, a mu at much higher multiples. Absolutely. And, and it goes back to, in, in both scenarios, the, the answer is the same and very hard, which is tell me the length of that, of that growth. So those, those companies that are trading at crazy multiples you think today is because the market thinks they're going to grow for a very long time. Now you are, you know, why do the fangs not so, seem so expensive anymore? Well, they've, they're 10 or 15 years old, you know, they've had that growth and now, you know, the bet is they're not going to grow as fast. Some of them, they can't grow that fast anymore, but that's a very interesting discussion. And then what's the price you pay for that? And that's the, the nature of the business. Right? It's interesting because when, when Michael Mobison was on, we talked about that a little bit. And, you know, electric vehicles is sort of an area right now where people, you know, think valuations are ridiculous. But he, he made the point that, you know, right now, this is really the market trying to sort out companies where the value of, you know, is going to be much, a lot of the value is going to be in the future. And, you know, it can seem ridiculous at the time with a high growth industry when you're trying to figure it out. But, you know, it, it may not be completely illogical in certain industries you know, as the market's trying to figure out, you know, where that growth is going to come from in the future. I'm wondering, I want to touch on this, you know, we've talked about this idea of systematic versus discretionary investing a lot. And I just wanted to maybe get an idea of how you think about that. I mean, obviously we've talked about where you're completely on the quantitative side, you know, and some people are completely on the discretionary side. You seem to be somewhere in the middle. And, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how much of your process is a systematic process and how much of it is, you know, the discretion of your portfolio managers. I'm going to answer a little bit with semantics, but then I'm going to give you a twist at the end to try to explain why, why I'm doing that. So we are very systematic in the sense that we have a process and all of our analysts must follow that process. All the companies, I as a portfolio manager have to follow these rules and can only invest in companies that have been brought forward by analysts. Uh, and we have a lot of push and pull within that, which maybe we'll get into. So we are systemic in that sense. However, we do allow a lot of discretion. And, you know, some of this is because the market is a complex adaptive system, which, uh, Michael talks about all the time as a, as a, uh, uh, former director of the, or, uh, uh, head of the Santa Fe Institute, uh, board. He knows this so, so well, uh, but you know, a complex adaptive system changes. And if you, if you have a system that doesn't recognize that, well, you know, the, you're going to be locked in to something that is no longer happening. For us in particular, we're not a quantitative house. We like data, but uh, we don't base our decisions on that. We have that discretion. And the reason is we want to have an owner for every investment decision. We can't, nobody can ever say that the model told us to buy. That's why we bought. That's, you know, Jim Simon and Renaissance would say that's wrong. <laughs> you know, you've got to do what the model says. Well, actually, if you push and shove, you'll find underneath almost all those quant shops that they do even make changes because they recognize that things that may have worked uh, in those models are no longer working today. For us, we want to have that human element to make a decision and then to be held accountable for that decision. So we have a system, but we have a discretion within that system. That actually might be one of the reasons I became a quant investor. Now I have, uh, you know, I don't have to accept blame if the, if things go wrong here, I can just say, oh, it, was, it happened to be the model didn't, didn't do what it was supposed to do. Um, just one more before I hand it back to Justin, I, I want to ask you, and I've, I've asked you about a lot of concepts that, you know, we have struggled quantifying and that, you know, that you really can't quantify, but one of the important things for growth companies clearly is having a good management team. And, you know, in, in looking at your process, clearly you guys are thinking about that and, you know, trying to evaluate, you know, and get the highest quality management teams. And I'm wondering if there are some bullet points in terms of the main criteria you look for in identifying what a good management team is. Well, I think you've correctly identified that pushing hard on one of the spots that's the hardest to measure. And, you know, how do you systemically manage the quality of a human being? I, I don't believe it's, it's actually pos uh, possible. But wait a minute, we have this management criteria, so how do we do it? And 
And then you have to layer on the fact that you're so prone to bias. So, you know, a good, a, a company that's doing well, guess what? Everyone says they got the, the best management, right? A company that uh, is not doing well, ugh, it's the management's problem. I personally, 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 sorry, am much more in the, in the uh, horse over the jockey camp. I think that good businesses uh, make good managers, but we do have some, some checklists. We do have some criteria. Uh, here is where the aspect of discretion comes in, but uh, there's one example. We've read some studies that companies where CFOs are more than 15 years younger than CEOs, uh, there's more fraud, you know, the C supposedly the CEO can bully the, the, the CFO. So is that a deal killer for us? No. Uh, does it raise a flag? Yes. So we have a, an entire list of checklist examples like this on things we'd look for that is part of our management checklist. In the end, it's at the discretion of the analyst to decide whether they think the management meets, meets our criteria, but we try to system, systematize it as much as we, we possibly can. One of the things I think we all do as investors is <clears throat> when we have been through bear markets or difficult market environments in the past, we tend to sort of look at maybe the, 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 the environment we're in, if we think there's risk and we, you know, try to sort of tie it back to something that we've experienced or been through. And, you know, you've had the vantage of going through a number of different bear markets, um, in your career. So I want to ask you, how do you, when you think about the night, 1999, you know, 2000, bear market in that environment, and then you look at the market environment today, how, how, are there similarities that you see or were they two very, very different environments? And so we, we really shouldn't be concerned today about, you know, what happened during that period with valuations and in, in the market. Oh, I think there's some definite similarities, you know, and there's some different, the old line, right? Markets are, or history doesn't repeat it echoes and there are clearly some echoes between the valuations you see today and, and what you saw back then. And, you know, you could almost always, there's a, a fundamental change that has happened. And people, uh, as, as I started saying, you know, overestimate the change, the impact of the change in the short term. And that's where you really see there, there's, there's a fundamental basis for every bubble that's ever existed. Now it gets stretched for a number of reasons, including, you know, monetary policy, including the extent of that change, excluding what's happening in the markets. If I think specifically of what happened, what's happening today versus, uh, what happened in 99, 2000, you know, uh, you, you can also get some data, right? Schiller PE goes back, uh, a hundred years. And uh, I think that the PE in nine, in 2000 or 99 was still more expensive than today, but not by a lot. <laughs> so I think it's still, uh, today's valuation is the highest it's been forever, except for, for 2000. Now, okay. The tech companies of today have profit profits that, uh, you know, pets.com or whatever the, 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 the poster boy of the, of the tech bubble in 2000 was, but you know, I can put SPACs up against pretty much any excess that existed back then. And, uh, we're going to look pretty pretty bubblish in a lot of those areas. So there's a lot of elements to it. Um, I was looking at your global, uh, equity portfolio, which you're partly responsible for managing it. And you, you hit, hit on this earlier, but I did want to ask, have you noticed a step up and you kind of signaled this, that you've been going a little bit more towards, um, or you've been, you know, pairing back, I think some of the positions that might be um, a little bit expensive here, but just generally speaking, have you noticed a step up in valuations across the board, across the majority of your holdings? I mean, are most of them trading at multiples higher than they have like historically? The very simple answer. A absolutely. And now, you know, is that justified? Well, interest rates are, you know, at all time lows or were cause until a couple months ago. Uh, and you know, as Michael Mobison talked about, you know, there, there are changes in the pandemic that were quite justifiable in terms of what happened in the market. You know, it brought forward e-commerce demand and, and things like that. So you're absolutely right. And, and we've responded to that in a number of ways. So we used to have quite a large overweight in the IT sector, technology sector. We've pared that down to almost no overweight. Uh, where are we finding our growth companies, healthcare, industrials on a 
country basis, we've, we still got a big, good portion of our portfolio in the U S but that overweight has reduced dramatically. And we're actually our biggest overweights emerging markets, which has had the worst year, uh, in the last couple of years. So you can see that response to valuations I talked about, not in my words, but in our actions, you know, what are we doing in the portfolio? One of the things that's changed here really in the last, let's say six months is I guess more concern about this persistent inflation and investors are obviously worried about that and rates kind of play into that as well, which I've wanted to ask you about in a minute, but how do you, clearly you guys are bonds up stock pickers, you're all analysts. So you're sitting at the table and you're, you know, coming to with these investment ideas, but when it comes to macro factors, how are, or aren't those included in the sort of investing process at the firm? Do you, they're hugely important and we don't include them. Wait, wait a minute. How's that possible? Right. Uh, I, I view macro as, as the, like the weather, right? I can predict it sort of, you know, for this week beyond that, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, as a result, we actually do not have any economists. We have no strategists. Uh, however, we have implied views. You know, you can look at, uh, the portfolio and say, you know, great example. We used to own a bank in Turkey. Um, now things started happening in Turkey. Uh, we don't own it anymore. You know, why? That's a macro view. Uh, we don't own anything in Venezuela. Okay. That's easy, but that was a macro view at one time. And the Turkey example is, is a great one because until the president started just gutting the central bank, literally putting uh, his son-in-law in charge of, of monetary policy, uh, and then going out and talking about how high interest rates cause high inflation. Uh, we had a fantastic bank. It was a dominant in its position, extremely well run, had through, been through many, many crises, crises, and then out comes uh, what is macro comments. And our analysts said, that's it. You can't operate a business uh, in this kind of uh, situation. So we didn't predict it. Uh, we responded to it. And I think that's, if you go back to that weather analogy, you know, when you go outside today, you'll look out the window. If, if it's raining, take an umbrella. Uh, if it's not, and it's not forecast to rain, you, you might want to risk it, but maybe you'll have an umbrella in the car. You know, that's, that, that's how I think about macro and investing. You respond to it. If, if you see it, be prepared for bad news. If you don't. Yeah. I like that weather analogy. You know, I think it's a lot of times, especially during heightened, uh, the times of market volatility, you know, clients sort of want to talk about that. And it's almost like they expect there's going to be some sort of reaction to how you're managing the portfolio because of some type of macro event. But to your point, you guys are really focused on knowing the companies inside and out and having confidence in that. And the macro stuff is just going to, it is what it is. It's, you know, what you're aware of it, but you're not making decisions based on it. One of the questions I, I did want to ask you is around this, um, idea that um, increasing rates and inflation, is going to be a headwind for, um, gross stocks. And that you could kind of segment out the gross stock universe in terms of like probably the most really ridiculously expensive stuff. And then obviously you can come all the way down to like quality growth investing, which is much more, but do you, are there certain types of stocks, maybe the stocks that you actually own, would are those the types of stocks you think would hold up better in that type of environment where rates are going up? I think there's an important distinction there between the stocks and the companies. <laughs> so the companies I think will hold up and that goes back to that pricing power and those Michael Porter and competitive nature of the businesses that we own. I, I think almost without exception, they'll all do fine. The challenge is the stocks, it's the valuations. And, and as you noted, right, the growth stocks are a long duration asset. So the lower the interest rates, the more attractive, uh, and the higher that DCF will be. So as a result, when interest rates go up, as a result of high inflation, there will definitely be a valuation impact. And as we noted, that's why we've been in our portfolios trying to reduce the weight of some of those most expensive growth stocks that, that we see for exactly that reason. The last question, well, two more questions here for you. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit more around behavioral finance and your investing process. And you kind of hit on this. You said that, you know, there is a consistent, repeatable process. You have a framework for making these decisions. You're not quantitative, but you, you do try to have, I think these investment rules and these factors you're looking at, but I thought it would be maybe interesting if you could like, 
walk us through, if you have an investment idea, if you have identified a new company that it looks interesting to you and you want to put it in the portfolio, how does that work like from start to finish, like in terms of your process and then putting it in front of the team and then, and then sort of the vetting of it, how, how does that actually work? So I, I think that these are wonderful questions because I'm guessing that most of what I talked about so far, you, everyone's like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. You know, that, nothing, nothing's that, that difficult. You know, what's the secret sauce and the way that we interact and, and, you know, some can call that the culture of the firm, but, uh, that is actually the key. And that's actually what I think is why Harding Lovner has done so well for, for 30 years. And it falls out in a, in a concept that we probably say, talk about too much called collaboration without consensus. So we want to work together, but we want each investment decision to own, be owned by an individual. And I, and I mentioned that. So let me go very specifically to what you said. I have an idea. Uh, I'm actually the consumer staples analyst within, uh, Harding Lovner. So if it's within consumer staples, uh, I have to prepare, I, I actually send out a note, uh, saying I like company X, I'm going to propose it for our investment list. We have some, uh, abbreviations and names for all, you know, for the investable universe that, that we can, we can cover. I then send a note out to everyone. Everything we do is by email. We have no meetings with one exception, which I'm going to talk about. We have no quarterly meetings, no daily meetings, no weekly meetings. We, if I have a question about a stock that's already, uh, covered by an analyst, I email it and I copy the entire group. So everyone gets to see the interaction. It's been great in the pandemic because we don't have to replicate this, uh, something that we didn't do before, but we have that communication. So everyone gets to see it. Continuing on your example. So what happens? I propose the stock, I get feedback. Rick, make sure you look at X. I've heard something about why I have another company I'm familiar with. They did Z. Okay. Understand. Then I put it through, we have a big template. It takes weeks, you know, one to two months, I would say to, to do all the work, uh, at least for me. Some of my colleagues are a little faster and smarter and they do it in faster, but for me, it takes me a couple months. Then we have the one meeting that is the only time we get together, which is when an analyst proposes a company for inclusion in our investment list. And that is a bit of a star chamber. Everyone's trying to poke a hole. Everyone gets together and tries to find a reason why the investment thesis won't happen. The analyst responds to those either in writing or in a, in a meeting. And then he or she, if they feel they can justify it, starts to cover that company. They rate it buy, sell, or hold it. You may have heard, I, I've not mentioned the word share price. So we don't talk about the price or valuation of the company until after we've gone through and decided whether it's a quality growth business. Then the analyst ranks it buy, sell, or hold. Now, just to get back to your question, now, as a portfolio manager, now that it's covered, I'm allowed to buy. I cannot, you know, have this, you and I talk about a stock and I go and buy it tomorrow. I will be fired the next day. It has to go through our process before it can be included in a portfolio. Then it's my decision. So I don't have to buy every buy rated stock. I don't have to sell every sell rated stock because for the portfolios, I own the decision. I can disagree with it. I can agree with it. I can push back, but it's my decision to, to, to own the stock or not. And then I build my own portfolio with a lot of rules, many of them specific to clients, some of them specific to our own diversification and risk requirements into a portfolio. But that goes back with that idea. You can, you can kind of see, I think that phrase collaboration without consensus working. You get this push and pull where everyone works together, but if the analyst says buy, their bonus determine on how their ratings go, not on whether I put it in the portfolio, which is different than a lot of portfolios, right? The people. In a lot of places, the analysts get paid if their ideas get into the portfolio. Okay. There's some sense to that. You know, I want my best, my clients to get my best ideas. The problem is we don't think that you, you let's put your behavioral uh, hat back on. We don't think that the best decisions are made by pleasing the portfolio manager. What happens is you get decisions that are thinking like I think, 
and not like the analyst thinks. And if there's a, a problem, they, well, you know, Rick liked that stock. That's why I rated it by. No, we don't have that in our organization. We want to dispel that kind of thinking and those kind of biases. We want the analysts to make up their mind and the portfolio to make up their mind. And through that push and pull, we think we get the best decision making. So we're really cognizant of, of behavioral biases and we try to find ways to, you'll never get rid of them, but to minimize them and to, and to recognize them. That's great. What percentage of companies that are presented, would you say, actually make it to buy in your experience? To make, make it to like, get, get a buy rating, get a buy rating. Not necessarily because you said, because you said they don't necessarily always make it in the portfolio and analysts might have a buy rating on it. Is it like, you know, what, but at, 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 of every 10 ideas that is presented to the group, right? what percent make it to buy, would you say? Well, I'll, I'll give you a couple numbers that'll, then, then I'm going to get to your, what I think is your real question. I think we have about 500 companies, 450 or something under coverage. And most of our portfolios have 75, 70 stocks. So what is that? 8% or something? Uh, no, uh, 13%, sorry. Um, but, uh, the. Not all of those are buy rated. So we have some companies that we've never rated by. So the analysts will bring forward a great business and it's just too recognized by the market. We don't feel we can add any value. So we have lots of companies that we bring uh, into our investment universe that are never buy rated. And to go back again, to give you an idea of what we're thinking about the markets today, that percentage is definitely rising. So the, uh, and that reflects the fact that the market's expensive. There are a few companies that are, we unrate, so we call it unrate. We take it out of the list every year, maybe four or 5% of the, of, and because you know, things change, the, the, uh, competition changes, the management changes, you know, somebody does a dumb acquisition. So there are those that are much smaller, but on balance, we'd much rather have a, a really large opportunity set that we can pick and choose from when. The price gives us an opportunity rather than, no, we're only going to focus all of our energy on, on these great companies that we're going to own today. Okay. That makes sense. And, and in terms of the, just one last question on this, cause this is interesting to me. Um, the sell, the se as a portfolio manager, removing a company is what would be, is it like you kind of hit on some of these, but is it, you know, slower growth, they make a bad acquisition, something changes in management. I mean, what, what's sort of the sell criteria at the portfolio level, all those things? Well, it, it, it failed. And, and actually I, that's one of the factors I did say we, in addition to, uh, all of the, uh, templates I talked about that we put together every, uh, we have pre-mortems, uh, you know, so we think about in the presentations, why will we actually literally say, why will we unrate this company in five years? You know, what would have caused that to happen? That's your classic pre-mortem. We also have mileposts that the analyst uh, must update with every result. So every quarter, every six months, whenever they report, which are in order for my investment, uh, thesis to work, this must continue to happen. And it can be everything from, you know, growing in excess of the market, maintaining a margin of 23%, you know, uh, making a good acquisition. I don't know. It's up to the analyst to choose. So failure of mileposts really then forces the analyst to think, do I still believe that this is a quality growth business? Now I'm going to give you another example, just because th these are good questions. And however, I, as a portfolio manager or any other analyst also have the option that if the analyst who covers it, so say I'm consumer staples and, and, uh, company X has done horribly, uh, and I'm just sick of it. Right. I'm like, I'm, I, you know, I hate them. They've missed this. They've missed that. If there's another analyst or portfolio manager who says, Rick, I think you're wrong. They can take over coverage of that, be responsible for that decision, have to take it into a meeting where I, who's covered it for X number of years, will be, you know, fighting them tooth and nail saying, I, I don't think we should own this, but if they want to take ownership of it, they can, that's that push and pull that we want. Uh, and you'll find that a lot, some of the more senior portfolio managers, well, it doesn't matter, senior or junior, somebody who owns it, maybe has identified with it too much. And if something goes wrong and the share price goes down, they just want that pain off uh, of their P and L if, if, if it's not the right term, but, uh, 
off off of, of of where they feel pain and someone else will say you know i think this is a great business that's going through a cyclical downturn i i think we should still it's something that we'd want to own in the future or maybe even at this price and they will take it over and then their performance of that stock will be and, and this is all transparent so every uh every analyst sees every other analyst rating every portfolio manager's decision uh, that we must explain. So everyone knows exactly what the other person is doing. And a year from now can look at the numbers and saying, Rick, you were an idiot. You know, why did you, uh, you take up, take up that stock or Rick, wow, you're, that was a good decision. And let's go back and see it, it's a really, it, and to do that, you know, that collaboration, not consensus, it requires a certain amount of respect, right? Cause you can't get an organization where people are trying to cut each other off at the, at the ankles. Uh, you need to have mutual respect and, th and that's not easy to achieve when you have individual accountability. So that's that whole secret sauce process. I think of, of Harding Lovner to have non-consensus decisions, but still have people collaborate and work together. By the way, something about this process that you're describing clearly works. Cause I was looking at the track records of many of your mutual funds and strategies and um, at least the ones I saw, um, and I'm not asking you to comment on performance because I know for compliance reasons, you probably can't, but, um, but the long-term the, the, the track records were excellent. Um, so clearly, you know, what you're describing here is a unique sort of competitive advantage that, um, your firm has in terms of finding investment opportunities and managing portfolios. Um, before I ask my, um. Last question here, Jack, did you have anything you wanted to piggyback off of there? Cause we kind of went off a little bit, but is there anything with the investment process you want to ask him? No, I mean, yeah, that was really interesting. You know, the, I guess the, is the general idea that, you know, when the analyst presents the stock, you, you're basically the first decision is, is this a quality growth company? And then once they, once you've agreed to that, the buy, sell and the hold comes, does that come from valuation, the buy, sell and the hold after it's, you've determined it is a quality growth company. Correct. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. That, that's a really interesting process. You know, it's, it's unique. It's, it's unlike anything I've seen and it, it makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, I've worked in other places, uh, other than Harding Lovner and I do, I don't know if we're a hundred percent unique cause I don't know a hundred percent of the, of the other, uh, uh, firms out there, but you, you need to have an organization built from the ground up on these kind of principles because, uh, it's hard, uh, to achieve the respect is a, is a probably too hard of a word, but at, at least the professional courtesy uh, of, of an organization, uh, when combined with accountability and, and it, it together, when it works, it, it's so powerful. And I, and, and I think you're right. That is part of the secret sauce of Harding Lovner. The standard closing question we have for all of our guests, Rick, um, is based on your experience in the market, if you could impart one piece of wisdom or teach one lesson to your average investor, what would that be? Well, I, I was going to, uh, say base rates, but <laughs> Malika Mulbison already <laughs> stole that. Um, but the, the problem is I was stealing it from him cause it's from his, uh, books, but, uh, I do think that outside view would, would be one, but uh, let me, let me try to use the semantics of your question to make it a little more interesting. You specifically said the average investor. So my one piece of advice would be recognize that you are average. Uh, that's a very hard thing to say, and, uh, it's hard for anyone to admit, but when you are up against, you know, uh, nobody would go swimming in the Olympics in a, in a couple of weeks, uh, thinking that they could win up against Olympic swimmers, right? You know, you are even an average, an average swimmer now. You could do something different. You know, you could challenge that Olympic swimmer to a poker game of poker and you have your odds are might be much better. Uh, you could play in, and let's pull it back to the stock market for a stretch this analogy too far, but you know, you can find a niche, but that where you think you can, you can win. Uh, and that can be because, you know, your, your investment horizon is different. Some of the institutional, uh, frameworks of, of the market is different. Uh, you can find something in less liquid stocks, but. If you recognize that you are average and how hard it is to, to outperform, I think it, it leads you to two decisions. You either let the professionals run it or, or you index, uh, uh, unless you really can find a niche. If you can find a niche, that's wonderful. Please, uh, 
Good stuff. Well, thank you very much, Rick. This has been um, really enjoyable, insightful, valuable. I think our listeners will get um, a lot from it. If people want to learn more about um, your firm and um, the investment strategies um, you guys run, where can they go to find out more? So the best place is our website, and uh, I'll give a double pitch for it. It's hardinglovner.com. Not only will you, I hope, find everything that I talked about, but you'll see we write quarterly newsletters, which, you know, most fund managers do, but I don't, I don't think many will put as much work into them as Harding Lovner does. We try to be extremely transparent to the extent that every one of our quarterly letters going back to the founding of the firm in 1989 is on our website. So you can see everything we've ever written and test what I just said to see if uh, what I'm saying is, is, is true. Great. Thank you very much, Rick. We appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.